now is the time for revelation. I guess it's been about 41 years ago now I was introduced to the subject of prophecy and was fascinated because I was a skeptic. I didn't believe the Bible had any special authority or unique uh, background. So uh, I saw this as something that could be tested in history. And uh, it was at that time that I began to study under some scholars and put together on my own a scenario of events that these prophets predicted would all come together shortly before the end times and what we call the second coming of Christ. And uh, as I put this scenario together from many different prophets, I began to see the broad outline of it taking place in our era, starting with the uh, Suez Crisis in 1956. And the, roughly, this scenario revolves around the rebirth of the state of Israel and a miraculous return of the people first in a, in a trickle and then in a much more rapid way to become a state against impossible odds and then to regain uh, control of their ancient capital, the city of Jerusalem. And according to the prophets, this was the key. Before that happened, nothing in prophecy was relevant to the end times. But with that as its key, then that whole scenario began to make sense because it said there would be uh, a revival of the ancient Roman culture and people that would begin to come together and unite. And I believe we're seeing that roughly in the European Union right now. What, uh, something in 1956 no one thought possible. Uh, at the same time, it spoke of this power to the uttermost north of Israel. Ezekiel, the prophet 2,650 years ago, predicted that there would be this power that would not be a world conqueror, but a regional power, and that it would furnish weaponry for a large group of peoples that, if, if you look at the names that are there, starting with Persia, it was the leadoff one, it's Iran, and all of the Muslim nations of the Middle East right now. And it said that this northern power would join league with, make a covenant with these peoples and eventually lead an all-out attack into the Middle East against Israel. Uh, then it said there would at the same time be a great revival in Asia and that they would uh, accumulate a tremendous army. In fact, one of the prophecies in the book of Revelation speaks of a 200 million man army coming from the Asian kings in the last days. And uh, they, this, I believe, we can see taking place right now. As a matter of fact, the ethnic background of the ethnic Russians today is even spelled out in Ezekiel chapter 38. Magog can be traced to the Scythians who are the modern ethnic Russians. So I believe that with this as the focus, that you can then begin to fit all of these other prophecies around. The most important thing uh, that was to take place would be that there'd be a great controversy about this reborn state of Israel, these nations which are named and, and they exist today as the Muslim nations of the Middle East. They would try to destroy this re reborn nation and uh, the real flame point would be a controversy over the city of Jerusalem. Right. Well, this is really happening even right up to this very moment, isn't it? How, it is. You know, lo looking at it from, say, just a, a news point of view, you know, so that people can relate to it in, in their own everyday mm -hmm. um, library, as it were, of newspapers, what would you, what sort of events would you point to to help them to understand that the Bible is really such a, a book of value to us to, mm -hmm. and, and for us to really take heed of? What, what events perhaps you could point to, you know, that are current? Well, uh, using that framework of the nations that are in place right now, uh, back in the late 1980s, the Soviet Union was gaining tremendous power. It looked like they could, uh, they could someday soon set up a Pax Sovieticus over the world. They were... Uh, they had such power and struck such fear in the world that it really appeared that they would be able to establish some sort of a world 
uh, dominion. And uh, I said many times on television through Trinity Broadcasting Network that something had to happen to stop them from gaining control of the world because this is not in the prophetic scenario. They're to be there, but not as a world conqueror, but rather as a regional power with a vast arsenal. I had no idea what would happen. But then, in the beginning of the 90s, the Soviet Union fell apart from within. And uh, many people thought, well, this negated the whole prophetic scenario. But uh, instead, it rather authenticated it because it fit the picture of it being a vast regional power rather than uh, uh, a world conqueror. And they are the greatest arms merchants to these very people that the prophets said would arm them for war. And they have accumulated, or they had accumulated it as the Soviet Empire, the greatest collection of weapons of mass destruction ever assembled by man on this planet. And with their, uh, their cause of disintegration, which was economics, they need hard currency. They found they couldn't compete in the uh, first world, uh, in the Western world, with, uh, with you know, making commercial products. But they were the best at making uh, essential products of war. So they have gone all out. They're on a wartime production footing right now of producing weapons which they're selling to the most dangerous nations on earth. I believe you've got some information, statistics about weaponry that's uh, gone astray from Russia. This is something that really is frightening because uh, it finally came out by a member of the defense department, one who had been in charge of certain weaponry in Russia, that they had uh, made 158 suitcase size nuclear bombs. And these were made especially for the KGB. Okay, so an individual person could be carrying one. They were made specifically for that. And as a matter of fact, they were, they were created for American cities. That, those were the targets. Okay. And this came out. Now, when... Uh, when it was recently announced, and I think it was a strategic thing, I don't think it was an accident, it was recently announced that more than 50 of these are missing. I think it was uh, done with the purpose of chilling the United States into being more careful in interfering in the Middle East if conflict goes there. Interesting. But given what is probably the tracking of those things, uh, the Russian mafia, which will sell to the highest bidder, probably has already got those suitcase bombs in the hands of people like the Libyans, the Syrians, and especially the Iranians. These are states that back, as a state, terrorism. And uh, this is one of the reasons why I believe war in the Middle East is imminent. Now, from, from a prophetic point of view, what, what scriptures could you cite really to to help people to understand that this is something, again, which uh, need, we need to take notice of. Well, as uh, Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39 are, are critical passages, and they warn that uh, this great power from the uttermost north, and by the way, there's only one power to the extreme north of, of uh, Israel, even if you discount the prophecies about their ethnic background. Uh, it says that this northern power would equip these uh, Middle Eastern nations uh, for war and that they would give them the deadliest of weapons. And so I see this transfer of these uh, weapons of mass destruction to that area as a fulfillment directly. And uh, especially since in 1991, February, Russia signed a, a, a pact with Iran uh, there was twofold of that. Russia signed the pact because of their fear of the Iranians spreading Islamic fundamentalism up into the, the uh, republics that were formerly part of the Soviet Union. They, they feared this would threaten Russia itself. So they agreed to supply Iran with top flight nuclear scientists and missile scientists with, with uh, off the shelf equipment. Uh, to help them produce nuclear missiles if they would agree 
to not promote in any way Islamic fundamentalism in the former Soviet Union area. And that pact was signed, and one part of it is if the West uh, truly threatens the Middle East again, that Russia would fight alongside the Muslims against the West. So the, all of that is in a treaty that was signed. I think the most dangerous treaty in the world is the axis between Moscow and Tehran right now. America's been the only nation really to stand by Israel. Do you really see this continuing? It's a good question. Uh, I think that you can trace an erosion of American support for Israel. There's still support, but there's been an erosion in the, in the government in our policy toward Israel. And uh, they have tried to be what they call more even-handed. And the only problem is when you step into the arena with the descendants of Isaac, which are the Jews, and the descendants of Ishmael, which are the Arab nations, plus the Arab culture that was spread through Islam to all the other nations, you're stepping into a 4,000-year-old blood feud. And that blood feud uh, is something that whiz-bang uh, diplomacy will never uh, be able to solve. You know, is it just a land issue between Israel and the Arabs? Is there more to it? No, oh, it goes far deeper than that. Uh, land is a problem only in that it is a religious sacred site. Islam uh, puts more stock by sacred geographical locations than any other religion in the world. And Jerusalem in particular and Israel in general is uh, their third holiest place. And now they've even run it up to be second only to Mecca. And so, yes, it is about that place, but because of the religious issue. And uh, this is why I've said frequently that it isn't a problem with the size of Israel that bothers the Palestinians, and they're just the front men for the whole Muslim world. It's the existence of Israel that bothers them. And so there's no way to negotiate that. I mean, you could whittle Israel down to the smallest possible thing, and they would still see it as the remnants of a cancer in what they see as their religious world. And so there's no way we'll ever settle that problem with simple diplomacy. Uh, it goes deeper than anything uh, the Western mind can conceive of because it goes back 4,000 years. See, the, the viewer might be used to the propaganda, if I can use that word. And that's what it is. <laughs> that really the Arabs are having a or the Palestinians are having a hard time. Mm -hmm. And really when you think about it, Israel, you just mentioned a second ago, is such a small country. Mm -hmm. I mean, for, for Europeans to perhaps identify that, it's probably smaller than, than Wales. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. You know, and yes. there's, this is a homeland for the Jews. But how special is Israel to God? Well, I think to the, sec to the secular mind, and certainly I understand this because I was as big a skeptic as anybody. I was raised with no religion whatsoever. Uh, to the average person on the street, uh, they could never understand why Israel would be special to anybody or why the people would be special to anybody. But uh, if you look at what the Bible prophets have said, and let's not fight about whether it's the Word of God or anything, just that it's an ancient book that uh, certainly can be established as having uh, reliable accounts of uh, prophetic history. Uh, this book predicted that God would destroy the nation of Israel, which he himself says he created. He would destroy it twice, and he would bring the people back twice. The first time was by the Babylonians. The second time was by the Romans in 70 AD. Only when Moses predicted in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 65 through 68, when he predicted the second dispersion, he said the people would be scattered throughout the whole world, and there they would have no hope. They would be persecuted relentlessly wherever they went and have no assurance of life. And then he predicts that in the last days, in fact, this would be the thing that would set up the last days these people would be miraculously brought back and established in their old homeland again, and this would start a great period of war. Now, that's what we see happen. And God says that these people 
are special to him. And you know, you, you can get caught up in the controversy of historians about who has a right, who owns the land of Israel. Uh, uh, the, certainly the Palestinians uh, and the Muslim nations in general believe that they have a right to it by the right of conquest. They have held that land for some 1,300 years up until 1917 when British under Allenby took it back. But uh, uh, they, they would have the same right that most of the modern nations today have to what they're living on, and that is the right of conquest. But there's only one nation on earth that can point to an ancient book claiming to be from God and say, our title deed is by the owner of this planet himself. Because over and over again, God says, and especially in Ezekiel chapters 36 through 39, he says, this is my land. So it really doesn't belong to the Jew or to the Palestinian. Ah, but God says in the last part of chapter 36, he says very clearly that it's not because the Jewish people are such good people or because they're better than anybody else that he's going to bring them back and put them back in that land. He says, I've given it to you through your forefathers. But it says it's for his great namesake that he's doing it. In other words, God is demonstrating for the whole world to see if they want to trace it, that he predicted he would do this, and in fact he has done it. And this establishes the greatness of his word, which by any fair evaluation, uh, such an, an, uh, an enormous prophecy with such scope to come literally true shows it had to have some kind of divine authorship. And on the other hand, it also shows the greatness of God and his power. And so he uses these people who certainly are no better than anybody else uh, as an instrument of demonstrating his reality and his truth because he has fulfilled the words of their prophets to the letter. And this is what we see as a continuing saga before our very eyes right now, reaching its latter stage. I believe the world is about to be plunged into the greatest holocaust that mankind has ever seen or will see again. Why do you think there's going to be a holocaust, a nuclear holocaust perhaps? The first nation allied, Russia is of course the one that's uh, featured in the Ezekiel's prophecy, 38 and 39. The They're the king of the north or Magog from the, uh, Gog from the tribe of Magog, Meshach and Tabal. By the way, in ancient writings we found uh, a reference to the wall of China when it was being built. They called it the Wall of Magog because everyone knew that the people from the tribe of Magog had become the Scythians and they were frequently called the, the uh, tribe of Magog. And uh, apparently they so feared these people, they built the wall to keep them out. But they are the modern, you can trace the Scythians to be the modern Russians. And uh, they're the first, the second is Persia. And of course, they're listed as the chief among the allies that will be confederated under Russia. So who's king of the south then? The king of the south is this uh, Muslim confederacy. Including Egypt and? Egypt is part of it. So it's Persia, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, and Turkey. Okay, now all of these are gonna be Drawn and Jordan, into by the way, is mentioned in part of it too. Okay. They're all going to be drawn into this final battle uh, to destroy Israel. Now, it says that all the nations would be gathered there, doesn't it? Mm, yes. So they're going to draw in the others. And China? What about China? Well, apparently this happens at a time when the whole world has been brought into a confederacy where there's a, a world federation with a ruler in Rome. And this is the Antichrist. Right. This is a man that will mesmerize the world. We know him in the Bible as the Antichrist, but to the world he will be the most uh, charismatic uh, genius that we've ever known. He will have real answers to the hard problems. And so for uh, a number of years before this takes place, he will have had brought the world into what seems to be great prosperity and peace. And then this is ruptured by this war uh, against Israel. And so 
once this war takes place, uh, even in the prophecy it talks about these other nations saying, why have you done this? Have you come to take a spoil and all that? The usual UN negotiation type of thing. Only this time they'll have a leader that acts. And so uh, Daniel chapter 11 verses 40 through 45 even traces the battle plan. Once the king of the north leads this confederacy of the king of the south, the Muslim nations against Israel, then it says, when he's standing in Egypt, news from the north and from the east will trouble him. Well, looking northward from Egypt, you would have Europe. So they apparently counterattack. This is a breach of the world peace. This is a, a move against a very strategic place for the world's economy. And so they attack to uh, reestablish peace and central control because whoever owns that land bridge that goes from the Bosphorus all the way around to the Suez Canal has the land bridge that connects three continents, uh, Europe, Asia, and Africa. So it's critical, plus the oil reserves throughout the region. So they attack. On the other hand, you've got Asia that's a major player and, and does not want to be cut out of uh, critical raw materials and strategic position. And so it says, the kings of the east, plural, mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 16, uh, they will gather together and they will move toward the Middle East with an army of 200 million soldiers. And so that's how the war goes. The first sequence is an all-out invasion of the, the Russian Muslim Confederacy. They're counterattacked by uh, the West led by the revived Roman Empire, which I believe was rough, going to be led by the 10 strongest nations of the European Union. Then there's this other attack that comes to counter the Western influence there, led by, I believe, China. With the image that Nebuchadnezzar uh, was given and Daniel interpreted, talked about the last ruling power being taken from the, the, the 10 toes. Well, you know, it's very interesting because uh, actually there's more prophecy about this power than all of the other powers put together in the last days. And uh, prophecy is very specific about who's going to lead the West and then the world. And that is a revival of the ancient people and culture that was Rome. And uh, I have, with many other, uh, many other students of this, identified the European Common Market, now the European Union, as the bed out of which this will emerge. And uh, certainly, I remember as late as uh, when I wrote The Late Great Planet Earth, it was in 1969, it was published in 1970. And there were a lot of critics of that book, especially some scholar from the Vatican. And he said, the number one reason I was a heretic was because, and this was what, 1984, he said, the, the reason I was a heretic was because I had said that Europe would unite. And he said, Europe will never be a United States of Europe. Well, it's come to pass. Look what's happening. Uh, I believed from the first time I studied this that there would be such a thing. I remember when they signed the Coal and Steel Pact in 1956. I said immediately from that, from prophecy, there will be a great... Uh, a great uh, acceleration of this. It will reach a point where it will be the United States of Europe. And uh, then the next question, well, what about the United States? We're leading the West right now and have been since World War II. And uh, as I searched the Scripture, there is not even an inference, and there are ways of doing it in prophecy, not even an inference of the United States being uh, a major power. And so... Uh, since the, the power is named and its capital is named in Revelation chapter 17, verse 18, Rome, uh, that has to be the major power. Which So from that time on, I began to predict a gradual erosion of American power. And now, frankly, we're known as the last world power, superpower, but we're a paper tiger. I mean, much less try to police some major conflict. We couldn't do it anymore. Many Bible scholars identify Europe as being the ten toes of the image, which represent the final world power before Christ's return. 
But isn't this a problem now there are more than 10 countries in the EU? The prophecy simply says that 10 nations will come out of this, uh, out, of the, out of what was once the Roman Empire. It's people and culture. Uh, what I see is simply that there will, out of however numbers they become, and I think it'll be larger than 30, uh, that out of that is going to come 10 nations that are the strong. And they will become the de facto leader. And uh, probably it'll be through economics that they'll become so strong. But they first come to the forefront. And then this great leader that the Bible calls the Antichrist and the beast, this great leader will come on the scene and with his superhuman intelligence and his superhuman ability to perceive things, he will quickly become head of those 10 powerful nations.